Today, I'm specifically here to talk to you all about grazing as an effective tool in your IPM, but also in public land management, using hooved animals in collaboration to build effective, fiscally sustainable and fire safe land management for munis municipalities and public lands. So one of the big pieces I bring here is, or the concepts I'm, I hope to come across is that we do need fiscal sustainability in our land stewardship. And one of the great ways to do that is through collaboration. And I'll speak to that more coming up. So first of all, I would love to talk about why is grazing an effective tool? Um, grazing does a lot of different things that um, mechanical work just simply cannot do. It aerates the soil and increases water absorption. Um, it reduces the fire fuel load and increases public safety. Also, just healthier fire ecosystems. The other great thing about grazing, and I know with uh, the cities that I work with and the public land managers, is uh, community relations and resident relations is a big piece of their stewardship that they have to work towards. So one thing grazing does is it really does engage the residents and communities in their public vegetation management. It gets people excited. It gets people interested in the work you're doing. Um, it's environmental stewardship through animal husbandry. We're not just about reducing vegetation. We're about doing ecological system regeneration and restoration. Um, so that's a big piece to highlight when you're trying to bring that into public spaces. Um, I will, you know, I talk about providing training and job opportunities to young grazers to serve local communities. So we're not only doing uh, effective land stewardship, we're also really trying to create job opportunities, provide training, create places for people to get this work and be on the land doing good stuff. We're also going to go into carbon cycling, increasing our carbon sequestration as we go into more policy in which we're hoping to reduce carbon output. We can also talk about how the animals can increase carbon sequestration and really good land stewardship can do that not just through trees, but through rangeland and grasslands. It can be great big carbon sinks. So we're going to talk about that as well. Increasing organic soil matter, which is one thing that grazing ruminants can do that mechanized equipment can't do through their manure and urine. They're actually adding organic soil matter back to the land as well. So we're kind of talking a little bit about how we changing how we do things rather than what we do. So it's a big vision concept as well as the grazing ruminants coming in. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is grazing and carbon cycling. Um, here's with a tree, which we all know trees a great big carbon suck and we want healthy root systems and there's carbon nutrient exchange below the soil that's going between the root system of the trees and the grasslands. So this is kind of showing you, it shows a cow, but it could be any livestock, that they're strategically grazed livestock, trample and naturally fertilize the land, producing more carbon and life in the soil is their piece here, but it's also more than that. They're actually grazing the, the grass, they're putting manure back into the soil, and then the important part is we're doing good grazing. So once the animals have done that work, they get off the landscape and that grass gets to regrow. So that's a critical thing to remember is grazing shouldn't be happening all the time. It should be a moving flock that goes across, does the work and comes out. Also grazing animals will add more aeration to the soil and they add more urine to the soil. So they're hydrating, which is, which is another great benefit for fires. We have a little more hydrated aerated soil and um, they are the one system that doesn't leave dry brows on the ground. You know, they're there. It's actually removed and transitioned. So it talks a lot about the root system here, microbial, microbial activity, CO2 from the air comes down through the plants into the root system and it turns into sugar to feed the microbial and systems down below. Grazing as a tool and, and why it works. So it, this shows, this is a little more agriculturally motivated, but I do think pulling in the agricultural community will help regenerative agriculture. We want to highlight that Grazing done well is going to increase um, diverse habitat. It's going to create a healthier system. Uh, the way they graze, it's not perfectly mowed. So you have a little bit of different layers of grass for things to live in. Grazing animals also, especially when you're grazing, or I'm sorry, if you're mowing large stretches, your likelihood of pretty heavy habitat impact is increased. You can have losses in snakes and rodents and frogs and lizards. There's a lot of death that follows a big mower. The grazing animals really don't do that. 
because they're coming slower, things can get out of their way. They actually are really good at maintaining a healthy habitat rather than damaging it because of their pace and their structure and how they graze. They're going to help with increased carbon sequestration in our grasslands, especially when they are grazed appropriately, and they can create climate resistance, climate change resilience with healthy soils. We all know this how important soil is. And also the piece that's missing here that I think is critical is creating local food hubs. If we the animals can also be a part of a local community food system, which makes for far more resilient communities, not having to source food from far away. It's just a healthier system in general. So we're going to talk a little bit about how this is one of the questions I get. How exactly do they help with carbon sequestration, sequest sequestering atmospheric carbon into the soil? So as we know, atmospheric carbon is brought into the soil through photosynthesis. It's the key piece here. The livestock just actually enact more photosynthesis to be happening over time. So it Photosynthesis is the process uh, in which we, um, the plants are growing up, they grab carbon dioxide out of the air and water and from the air and add water and water from the soil using sunlight as an energy source and result in oxygen. So they're feeding us, but they're also grabbing the atmospheric carbon out of the soil. They're bringing it down in, I'm sorry, out of the air, bringing it down into the soil. Um, where it, which it breaks down um, and becomes carbon and carbohydrates, which are food for the soil. So how it work, how grazing increases this. Trees are really critical and we want to keep our trees, but we also live in a fire ecosystem in which our trees need to be spaced out, large, healthy trees. And I've learned a lot about that with the indigenous fire ecologists I work with, how we need to spread out our trees. We do need the small, thin ones reduced, and we need large, healthy trees supported. And we want to make sure those large healthy trees have enough resources to sustain, which means we don't have a lot of smaller trees dra drafting on that nutrients or that water around them. But the grasslands around them are a critical part of our carbon sequestration as well. And that's why grazing during the growing season is the critical way that we do increase carbon sequestration, atmospheric carbon sequestration. So when the animals move along, they graze the plants, and the you know grasslands have been grazed for millennia. These ruminants and grasslands or ungulates and grasslands have developed over time together. They move off of that grass and the grass, after it's been eaten, it drops its lower root systems, puts that carbon into the soil, and then they begin growing, which is an increased, car increased photosynthesis through that growth period. So that grazing of that, Prescribed grazing in which we graze and then rest is how that plant regrowth is this big, a massive amounts of photosynthesis happening through the growth, which is why we do need grazing to happen or land stewardship to happen during our growing season. We don't want to wait until we have tall, dry grass to do our grazing because we're not getting that really helpful carbon sequestration happening three to four times during our growing season. And if we do that, we can, and we do it well, we can also increase the root systems in the grasses that are there, increase carbon deeper, deeper, deeper into the soil, and keep those grasses long, greener longer because we've helped them develop appropriate root systems. So this is just a little bit more about that. And this is one of my sheep, Tug. He, he was, uh, just to give a little side information. He was called Tug because it took four of us to pull him out. He was a little too big when he came, but he's one of our sweet fiber weathers who does a lot of grazing and serves our community and also is just real pretty to look at. So pasture plants have been found to move, remove about 30 to 50 percent of the carbons acquired through photosynthesis into the soil. So if we think about grasslands, pasture plants are grasslands or rangelands. If we think about the number of acres we have in open space and grasslands, and if we are doing this grazing in a good way, how much carbon can be sequestered by appropriate grazing. So we're bringing, we're thinking about not just vegetation, but healthy land stewardship and land stewardship in a way in which we have ongoing healthy systems. That's really the goal of all of this. Okay, just wondering, it's enough, I had a question there. Okay. Um, the, so, and also increase soil microorganisms and soil carbon, like we're looking at a whole healthy system. 
the result of this whole process is that on average pasture plants are able to move about 2200 kilograms of carbon per hectare hectare per year into the soil and i imagine this is through a research paper let's see if we can increase that through grazing three to four times during our growing season so another big piece that I, you know, as we're talking about our IPMs and public land management is we have an engaged and supportive communities and municipalities working together. Um, I've, I've worked with, the, you know, Sonoma County and City of Petaluma, which I'm going to go into our projects later, but one of the biggest burdens of them developing new projects and the way forward is negative feedback from community members. So part of this work is also about community engagement talking to people, community education, and the animals on the land engage people in a way that other ways forward don't do. So here's just some pictures of a community walking the sheep down this down the road to their neighbors to get the grazing done. And this is how the sheep move, just walking along. Everybody gets to help, and it's kind of an interesting experience for everybody. So grazing can be done by all the animals. We have sheep, cows, goats here, the different animals, do different work. Um, if you have large tracts of land, especially if you have high predator loads, cows can be a great tool. They do very good grazing. They go across the land. You can use uh, portable electric fencing for them as well. So you get that good grazing and recovery. And often that can be an exchange with a rancher. So you're not paying for the grazing to happen. Municipalities and land managers, public land managers can actually reduce their annual costs by collaborating with ranchers so that the ranchers get access to that land and graze it appropriately and regeneratively and the public land stewards don't have to pay for that that it's just it's contractualized but it's that exchange so we can break down the fiscal responsibility of public land managers in their ongoing annual vegetation needs but we're also creating a healthy food system for for the local ranchers producing our food and taking care of our landscapes sheep are grazers as well they generally graze down. They can they can go into critical zones or maybe you need lighter animals. Uh, they can do a lot of different work and goats are our browsers, which they're great at going up. Goats like to go up similar to deer, eat brush. Um, they can go into zones in which there's a lot of understory, a lot of brush, a lot of coyote brush in which we're trying to transform that and create a little healthier system. They can also co graze together. So understanding that all of these animals and grazing together, depending upon what your goals are and what you're trying to do and what your landscape looks like and what your community members are interested in, you can use any of these animals in a really healthy way to do your vegetation management. Um, okay, so the next little bracket, that was kind of about how grazing works. The next bracket is about the upcoming policy. I'm working on some of this policy, some of this policy um it, it, some of them is limiting diesel and chemicals as tools to municipalities i know that most of the people i work with are looking to transition before they lose those tools and i want to help public departments adjust to these new regulations give you the tools and the way forward so maybe you aren't having to try to figure it out really quickly as it comes comes upon you um grazing is a tool that doesn't use diesel or chemicals and again, it engages residents and communities in public vegetation management. I, I, I wanted to state that again because what I find is a, there's a lot of community feedback on the reduction of synthetic chemical as a tool. Again, I don't think it has to be eliminated, but you're going to there is a lot of community pushback on that. So if you can highlight you're doing it differently, you may get that engagement in a different way and less complaints and less fighting from your community that you're trying to serve. You're looking at environmental stewardship. So also, if there is a need for reduction of invasive non-native, if there's a need to get forest health through understory uh, grazing, the animals can do all of these things. They can be applied in a way that you get all of your needs served, and uh, we just create the structure and the setup to do that. I think a key thing is to begin with public education and vision development, uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, work with and hire land stewardship consultants so that your way forward is paved well and you have a successful a successful development. Let's have the pilot projects and the beginnings go well so you get engagement and you can continue to go in a positive way. 
I also think it's great to pilot new projects, do baby steps, start small, and adjust your plan accordingly to what works, what doesn't. It's just so much easier to begin implementing pilot projects now before you lose your other tools and see how that can be brought in to support you in your way forward. So these are the, the policies we'll be talking about, AB 99, that I'm specifically aware of or working with. I'm sure you all know many other policies that are out there, but these all are a little bit specific to grazing on some level. AB 99 is a policy reducing the use of broad application of synthetic chemicals for roadside vegetation management by Caltrans. Um, and we'll talk about that. That is kind of, Caltrans has used grazing as a tool. We're trying to find ways to help support grazing as another tool so that we can keep our roadsides healthy. And I'll go a little bit deeper into that when we go to the AB 99 slide. SB 675 is a policy led by CalCan, which is a great organization, advocacy organization, that will integrate livestock grazing into California as existing wildfire pre prevention programs, which means with CAL FIRE um, and a lot of other things, we're trying to increase the use of grazing for healthy fire ecosystems and prevention of wildfire. Rather than having to always fight the wildfire, we'd love to set it up so that we just don't have devastating wildfires. We have healthy fires that burn low and are stoppable before they do damage to infrastructure. AB 136 is banning the sale of gas powered landscaping equipment, which is going to affect all public land managers and your IPM and parks and all these systems. And then EON 7920 is the executive order to ban all gas powered vehicle purchases by 2035 and diesel. So that that gives you a lot more time to plan for that. So I'm hoping to come in here and and help plan. And there's some goats doing some work. You can see the picture on the right is a goat that actually jumped on the sheep's back to get a little bit leverage on, to get a little more browse higher on the plants. So AB 99, before I go too far into this one, it didn't make it through appropriations. So this bill is no longer is dead, but it was really thought out by local residents in Sonoma County. They were trying to follow Humboldt and Mendocino County, which already have this uh, with Caltrans in which it's an eco ecosystem based strategy that focuses on long term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of te techniques, excuse me, such as biological controls, habitat manipulation, mod modification of cultural practices and use of resistant varieties through which pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates they are needed according to established guidelines. So again, this this bill was not trying to eliminate the use of pesticides because sometimes this is a tool that absolutely needs to be used. It was just saying let's not do a broad application. This bill was created after from residents who are seeing broad application and after learning that um, many of our indigenous basket weavers do their gathering of their willows in, in the roadsides, in the ditches of the roadsides because that's where a lot of the native willows would grow and they we're getting a lot of mouth cancer due to the pesticides applications on those willows. So understanding that broad spray of a chemical for management is if it's got much broader impact than just getting vegetation down. And also the experience of sprayed vegetation doesn't necessarily reduce our, our fire risk because sprayed vegetation often it just leaves dried browse. So how do we transform these ecosystems along our roadsides to be more fire resistant, healthier for those gleaning the tools and the plants and the tools in those roadsides, and just safer for all the community members. So again, pesticides are only used after monitoring. Treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organism. We, we all wanna advocate for the reduction of invasive non-natives. That's definitely going to keep us all healthy. And sometimes pesticides need to be used, but just targeted on those plants. And also just bringing in the grazing and let's use them to target those plants. Sometimes they do a really good job. So that was the vision of that. It's no longer active, but it was going to start transforming a statewide organ organization like Caltrans to really think a little bit different and develop grazing as a tool for a healthy road system rather than just vegetation management. SB 675 is a bill that I've worked with CalCan a lot on, and it's a bill that would expand the definition of fire prevention activities to include prescribed grazing 
Um, and this is defined as the lawful application of grazing by a specific kind of lost livestock at a determined season, duration, and intensity to accomplish defined vegetation or conservation goals. Again, policy is so wordy, but really what we're looking at is good grazing. So duration, inten intensity to accomplish goals. So are we trying to get rid of an invasive non-native? Are we trying to do um, create a system for the natives to come back? Are we trying to do increased carbon sequestration through multiple uh, grazes? Um, or are we really just trying to do wildfire fuel load reduction? It depends upon what that community, what that municipality, what that public land manager, or what a private land owner wants to do. The animals can be done for that, and they can you can apply for funds like a CAL FIRE grant to help do that for ecological regeneration and all those things. Really, the goal is also to promote biodiversity and habitat improvement for special status species. So we really want to protect the plants that we want and try to remove the invasives all while doing healthy ecosystem practices. We also really wanted this. This bill is really highlighting best practices and funding for use of prescribed grazing for reducing wildfire risk in and or near fire threatened communities. So we need to we need to be really strategic and holistic in where we graze. What are our communities that are either underserved and don't have the capacity to do their vegetation management? What or our communities that are really high risk fire zones? And how do we apply the treatment of grazing in a way that is healthy for the ecosystem and safe for those communities? We need long term community resiliency. And that's what a lot of community grazing cooperatives do is we actually support those communities to have their own flock to manage their own system and to feed their their communities as well. So it's that all that system, but that can be done in public and private landscapes. So that's SB 675, which is, is still in action and moving forward. I may be going down to speak in Sacramento on that one to try to really improve that bill's likelihood of going through. And AB 1346, I've spoken a lot with the city of Petaluma because they're really trying to get ahead of this one. Um, to adopt cost effective and technologically, technologically feasible regulations to promote engine exhaust and evaporative emissions. So, to, so really what it does for the cities is it, um, it takes away their ability, as you all know, sure, to use gas powered vegetation management tools. So they're transitioning to um, electrical. Uh, the problem that when the, with the people that I work with, like the city of Petaluma is the electrical tools just don't have the battery amount to the batteries are can be expensive. They don't have the battery usage to get the work done when they need to get work done and they don't have the charging system and the charging takes longer. So it's requiring a lot of their staff to wear backpacks, which is increasing with extra batteries and, and power equipment, which has led to increased worker comp claim, workers comp claims. Uh, it's an increase in the demand for electricity, so they're having trouble just having enough charging stations. So just the the transition is something that's becoming difficult for them to maintain and increasing their budget and the implementing of grazing on the landscapes has actually been able to really reduce some of those costs for them and reduce um, workers comp claim, but yet keep people active and working, just able to do things within their ability. And then this is the last one, EON 7920, which is not until 2035, but this, so it gives everybody a little more time to plan for this, but what it, the, the burden of this one, the thought is we're really trying to reduce carbon output, which is great, but we currently don't have systems in place for the big infrastructure, like the tractors, the mowers that the cities and counties are using. We don't have electrical components that can manage what the load that the gas ones are doing. So how do we start to develop a way forward now before that tool is eliminated so that by the time 2035 gets here, we have a plan in place and the cities and counties are not overwhelmed with trying to do a quick change. So we are beginning with pilot projects. We're bringing in livestock. We're creating collaboration with the ranchers so that a lot of the open spaces that were managed through mowing are now managed through livestock and are really collaborative visionary way in which the the counties the regional parks the cities are getting their vegetation management met 
and our food producers who are limited with land access are having land access and doing good application of regenerative grazing on those landscapes. So this is the bigger things when we are only switching to electric and the diesel is no longer available to us. We need to have those big landscapes that need management. We need those systems in place and animals can really help with that transition. And then last is I'd love to, I'm would love to talk about the demonstrations of holistic and sustainable public land management with grazing. So I'd like to highlight two different places that have really begun piloting new projects, new way forward. I do live in Pengrove, which is in Sonoma County, just outside of Petaluma. And Sonoma County has been hit really hard by wildfires. 2017 was incredibly damaging, and we are blessed through that to have gotten some PG&E funds and our county's doing a lot of funding of resilient forward thinking projects to help with their land stewardship. And also the city of Petaluma is the other one that I'm working with and I'll talk more about those. So the city of Petaluma is the pilot grazing project. We'll go deeper into that. And there's plenty of articles and things you can read about that if anyone wants to Google it. And I'm gonna give you kind of their long-term vision. The Sonoma County, like I said, is funding a climate beneficial grazing program. So this is going beyond, this is about creating resilient communities, creating a path forward as climate change is happening. How are we going to manage these spaces, reduce wildfire? Because as most of you know, devastating wildfires are putting way more carbon into the atmosphere than anything else. We're just speeding up the warming climate by the fires that are happening because of the warming climate. So how do we pre be proactive? How do we do a better job of land stewardship of our public spaces so that we don't have devastating wildfires? We have healthy low burns that are manageable. Environmental stewardship through animal husbandry, valuing the work, training, hiring new staff, beginning to put some funding into it now so that we aren't putting massive funding into it later. Build out the project slow and small, fund them, develop them, train it trained people begin to do implement the changes now so that we are hitting certain transitions and we're we just don't know what to do and we're throwing heavy heavy money at staff to try to manage the landscapes we can do it differently let's start now again finding holistic ways to implement grazing within within your budget developing that now so you have that developing relationships and collaborations with consultants that are fire ecosystems consultants foresters ranchers grazers and community members community members who advocate for this work will help you so much so engaging your community members that think this is the way forward that believe in this way they are going to change the views of the other community members they're going to get people on your side and not fighting you that's a lot that that helps a lot <laughs> And beginning to see a new way forward and engaging with professionals to build out these new concepts. So again, we're talking about the city of Petaluma and the county of Sonoma. These are just two that I'm going to talk about. I'm sure there's there are so many more of different ways forward. Um, Ojai Valley is doing a really interesting thing. Santa, um, Santa Barbara County is doing a whole county grazing. So there are these things going on all over. I'm just going to highlight these two that I'm very familiar with. So sustainable, sustainable and pub, public land management and IPMs, IPMP. So one of the things Petaluma, City of Petaluma is doing is they're having to rewrite, the, rewrite their IPM and they're a cool city. So it's, it's wrapping up into public land management and the rewriting of an IPM and writing in the tools there that help them the way forward. So this is, they're coordinating and deploying the recommendations of local land steward consultants in public and working on public and working landscapes and it's centered on creating a replica design for subsequent broad scale adoption of fire prone regions in the west so both of these are ways forward for counties for municipalities and the goal is for regionally for us to get healthy systems in a sustainable budgetary sustainable way with community backing and support so that we can all kind of come together and collaborate and work forward on this together so the goals are to develop collaborative relationships between municipalities and ranchers to reduce the ongoing cost of vegetation management. How do we begin those relationships now so that we don't aren't having to pay for annual vegetation management and we're having much better management because the grazing is happening multiple times a year and we're, we can count on that carbon sequestration to be happening throughout the growing season. Supporting municipalities and public land managers in the deployment of land stewardship methods 
documenting and highlighting the success and key learnings for fire resilient communities and public lands. So we're trying to document everything that's working, document things that aren't working, being willing to be flexible, move with what's working for the parks department, what's working for the water department, how is everybody work receiving this, and how is the community receiving this so that we can continue to adapt and do better and show what works and what doesn't so that as people pilot out projects on in their cities or in their public spaces, they have this showing what worked and what didn't. And you know, also the other goal is to create collaboration between different cities building out these projects so that they can support each other ongoing as they find what works and what doesn't work for them. Providing education opportunities and ongoing support to IPM managers. How do we continue to build the education and opportunities? Municipality leaders and communities and fire prone regions. How do we all come together and collaborate and build this out so that we're all on the same side? Because we really are. It's just the messaging and the story that we need to work on. Um, so implementing holistic, ecologically and fiscally sustainable land management plans and IPMs to create healthy fire ecosystems using grazing ruminants. One of the things I want to highlight is that we're transitioning our vegetation from a burden to a resource, and that is a key thing that is really going to change our way forward. It's a resource. Let's bring the people in that find it a resource and let go of the burden of your management. And you get to look at all these cute lands. That's always enjoyable. So the city of Petaluma um, Park Management and IPM Development. They're currently working on IP IPM development. They have a lot of community members pushing hard to completely remove synthetic chemicals as a tool at all for the city. Um, and they may have to completely remove it from their IPM. The city of Windsor did remove it from their IPM and they're really struggling with keeping up with vegetation management. Um, and they wish they could backtrack at this point, but it's very hard to. And community members really here in Sonoma County and Petaluma is definitely one of them are trying to say that zero, zero application. So the parks and the cities are are just having to kind of work under that umbrella of very active community really pushing for it. So in this one, this, so we're working on their they're rerunning their IPM development, but they're also trying to figure out a way forward as they're losing their um, ability to use a lot of the gas powered tools as they're understanding the capacity of staff and electric equipment, what it can accomplish. And the city of Petaluma has a lot of open space parks which is beautiful. It's very, very lucky to have these. And they also have open open space landscapes. They have a private airport that has about 100 acres that needs to be managed. Um, sometimes a lot around the water system, there's a lot of open space. So they're looking at all the space that needs management, vegetation management. And historically, they just really worked to get it down, I think, by July 1st, which is what the fire department wants it down. Now they're looking like, how do we manage this differently, better, and reduce our budget all at the same time? So they're developing a first of its kind sustainable grazing plan for vegetation management and ecological regeneration for all open space parks in the city of Petaluma. This year, we're piloting a project in which we are, they did hire a contract grazer to do these parks which means that grazer will manage the livestock, will move them around so that they get the goals that the, that the parks and the community members are, um, are wanting. We picked Oak Hill, Manion Knolls, uh, West Ridge, Country Club, and Arroyo Open Space, total of 40 acres. The reason these were picked were they were open space, space um, parks that are oak woodlands with lots of vegetation underneath, and they abutted communities, lots of residential communities, sometimes on both sides. So the management of these places is so critical for vegetation management, for the aesthetics, for the community, and just to keep everybody safe because they were parks that were hard, very, very labor intensive to manage and also really close to lots of residents. And if a fire were to start in there, it would be devastating. So the goal of the pilot project was this year was primarily let's get the parks that are difficult to manage, take a lot of labor, and in which the a fire in these parks would, would be devastating to the communities around them. Petaluma in Sonoma County is a city that's blessed with not actually being hit by wildfires so far. So we're gonna demonstrate with them that they can keep that going through, through a grazing component, all while being a part, they are part of the, cool cities, so they are working to become carbon neutral by 2030. So this is a part of that plan as well. 
they're losing their tools for vegetation management, but they're also pushing to become carbon neutral, which means that if they can demonstrate that the grazing is done in an ecological way, if we can measure the carbon in the soils and start to really demonstrate that they're increasing the carbon into the soil and they can demonstrate the lands that are being ecologically grazed are doing a carbon dump into the soil, they actually can increase their ability to become carbon neutral. So they're not just reducing output, they're increasing input into the soil. So uh, the, re the residents are very excited about this as a tool so far. Um, in the vegetation management, we are not doing any groom groomed parks. There's no park, no soccer fields are being grazed. So there's no manure component that's, it's not in places where playgrounds are happening or anything like that. So that's one thing you do need to think about in public places that all of our groomed parks, nobody really wants grazing animals because of the manure. So it's more for open places and next to hiking paths and those kind of things. So as they develop and are finding that the new IPM, they're not going to have synthetic chemicals. The, this is a tool that's working for them. This is a tool that's taking over a lot of the electric direct equipment. The city parks managers are so far, they're, we're, they're actively grazing right now, have really liked the looks of the places the animals have been. They appreciate the work. Um, they are um, finding out they ha we haven't had any real community complaints. One of the concerns was manure, but as long as we're staying off the, the places where kids play, nobody seems to be as concerned about it. We're also looking at a holistic long-term solution for their vegetation management plan. So this year was just this pilot project of grazing the five parks. This fall, after these parks are grazed, we are creating a holistic plan for all of their open space places, including a, around the city. They have a lot of uh, large lots that are like 200 plus. The airport is about 100 acres. How do we create grazing exchange, contractualized grazing exchange? So these get grazed. We provide the rancher next door with access. Usually we're trying to do it with a next door neighbor that can just open a gate and get that grazing done. So we're looking at getting all of the vegetation needs met through grazing and open space facilities. Now they still need um, lots of staff to take care of their groom parks. There still needs to be groom park management. This is just the open space that was heavy labor and difficult to manage and often left a little untended and unsafe for wildfires. So we're bringing back that healthy ecosystem at the same time. So that's the city of Petaluma. The Sonoma County um, is looking to develop a more resilient and carbon neutral county. So a lot of this comes to resiliency, fire fuel reduction, and also carbon neutral. It's a heavily coined term at this point. A lot of people are looking for this. We're decreasing output, but we also really need to think about increasing input. Like how do we do we increase our drawdown? Grazing um, rangeland grazing grasslands is one of a really critical way to increase that input. And Sonoma County has a lot of grazable land. Forest can be well grazed as well. Take care of the trees, graze the understory so that you, that ladder fuel that takes the um, fire up into the trees and creates a devastating wildfire. We're trying to reduce that with the animals. So you have healthy trees, healthy forests in which again, a, a fire is easily contained and, and healthy and not killing off all of our beautiful old oaks. So the goal of the Sonoma County project is to assess the total, gra total grazable acres in Sonoma County and work with landowners and land public land managers to better manage these lands to achieve climate mitigation and conservation goals. So we wanna make sure we keep wildlife corridors. And that's the nice thing about of these grazing systems is we're using fencing in which wildlife can pass very quickly through or the animals are coming in and leaving. We're also creating ecosystems that create a better habitat for wildlife. We're not taking down everything. We're creating, leaving enough shrubs and stuff for wildlife. We're also making sure that we're reducing our fire fuel load because the fires are devastating to our wildlife. Once the animals come through and there's new regrowth, deer love the new regrowth. So we, our browsers can come in and do that work. We're reducing tick loads, which is one of the biggest problems for some of our wildlife by making sure we don't have all that heavy brush. Let's reduce our tick load and create a system in which we could even do prescribed burns. Prescribed burns and grazing go well together. So this is all about land stewardship, healthy systems for wildlife, uh, improving our conservation goals, and also climate mitigation. How do we create resilient communities? How do we do more carbon sequestration so that we can 
manage a changing climate in a really strategic way and a healthy way. So the goal of this project is to create Sonoma County was did resilient communities and ecosystems through University of California Cooperative Extension. They did apply for the funds and then they hired me to help facilitate grazing collaborations across the whole county strategically. So we're looking at where the fires have gone. We're looking about what grazers are up there. We're creating strategic connections and uh, collaborations in which the animals can move across whole zones. Bennett Valley in Sonoma County. I don't know how much you guys all know of Sonoma County, but we're working on a collaboration in which we will have animals moving all the way across the county, kind of a big herd that just does the vegetation management. And that's a not the, 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 that's a valley that has been hit pretty hard by fires. So how do we connect the dots, oh, create land access and create vegetation management and connect communities together so they take care of each other and the spaces are healthy for wild for wildlife as well. So it's a wild oat hollow led effort that educates landowners and managers on vegetation management tools to assist with fuels reduction and ecological enhancement on private and public lands. So that's the other nice thing about grazing. We can go across private and public lands. The animals don't care. Buyers don't care. They cross all of our property lines. Property lines don't matter to ecosystems, to wildfires, to livestock, to wildlife. We need to think a little bit broader and our strokes need to be broader for valley wide across property lines where everybody has their individual property line, but the animals move through, do the tending and they move to the other place. That's the goal of this. And we are highlighting and really working on the wildland urban interface, the WUI, because those are the zones that we can really protect our, our, our critical residents that need more protection. So we're also working with youth high school agricultural pro programs and the Santa Rosa Junior College to bring in and uptrain people on how to do the grazing, how to work with communities, how to uh, manage livestock through communities and how to do carbon soil sampling, just engaging young people and uptraining them so that as we have the work and the grazing cooperatives that need someone to tend them, we have the people to fill those spots and they can be connected with those communities serve the communities, the people, the animals, and the land all together in a really sustainable way. So, IPM planning and public land management can create a way forward in a time of new policy implementation and climate change through grazing collaboration, strategic planning, and big vision. So, I'm just here to talk to you about all these options and tell you there's a lot of different ways forward and you know these are the some of the communities that have grazed together and there's a uh, chase of chasing goat grazing and one of his dogs livestock guardian dogs are a great way for um predator safe animal livestock production this is how we can come together be strategic big have a big vision and think of a way forward before we are forced to like let's start the pilot projects let's begin now so that all these things can be there and available to us when other resources are removed from our ability to use. And that's it. I am here for questions. I'm Sarah Kaiser, Wild Oat Hollow. I do help um, people build out these projects, but I'm but I'm also help uh, would happily just connect you to people maybe locally. There's a lot of ways forward, and I'm just happy to be a part of it.